All right, good evening everyone. We're going to be starting shortly. I'm just doing a couple of things in the background here, trying to get more familiar with OBS Studio and uh, <clears throat> setting up everything. It's twilight. There is uh, weather here is a patchy clouds. Let me turn off this other thing here. I was monitoring. Okay, enough. <laughs> Wait a minute. Where is this coming from? Oh, sorry, guys. Boy, <laughs> sorry about that. That got buried in my other computer. Didn't know where that was coming from. Anyway, uh, it's a bit cloudy right now. It's, um, well, not too bad. It looks like there's going to be patchy clouds going ahead, going overhead, and it should continue to clear. I had my doubts if I'd even have this tonight. Um, what I want to do is I want to go over a uh, little bit about ECOS, the setups that I do, the uh, standard operating practices, kind of show you a few things uh, about ECOS. Um, let me see. All right. <laughs> I might be the only viewer. <laughs> and that's what's fun about this. All right, well, let's go ahead and I'll get started. And um, what I could do is repost this on YouTube. Uh, what I want to talk about, or at least let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and uh, bring up. Well, I think I'll go a little bit about my equipment. <clears throat> I have a little video here that I'm going to talk over, and hopefully the timing will be done correctly on this. So um, just bear with me if I if I happen to mess up on this. Okay, so let's go ahead and start this. Um, I think it's going to start. Uh, nope, nope, nope. Why am I not starting here? There we go. Sorry. <laughs> new software, new toys. This is my setup. This is a uh, William Optics uh, 73 millimeter. I usually use for the winter time. It's quick and easy to set up. I have an Ioptron uh, 45 Pro. Right there, you'll see the Do controller that that controls the Do. Uh, it's I have to. I can't remember the person who who originally created or uh, designed it. Uh, I re I basically rebuilt it. This this is the um, ZWO ASI 533, and then this is the uh, KHY, um, I think it's um, 2 version, or 5 version 2. Uh, there's also in here the focuser. This focuses the telescope, so I could focus it when I'm inside the, uh, the uh, shack here, or the, uh, the basement here. And uh, again, there's a picture of the guide and the uh, guide camera. Cable management is pretty straightforward. I go in and just bring all the cables down and I happen to have an old pier that I used for uh, another telescope that I adapted to use on this setup. So it's nice because it has a nice tray out there and it's a very solid mount. Uh, as we back away from here you'll see what I mean by that. Um, uh, just a little more views of the scope here. And uh, and I oh there's the Raspberry Pi that's the Raspberry Pi four and I'm running hardwire uh, internet to it or hardwire cable to it I'm not using Wi-Fi and then you'll see the black cable that goes up to the hub which sets up on the tray and it's all powered by a single 12 volt power supply and you can power this using a battery a nice deep cycle battery and it'll last all night very easily so that's the setup um, I wanted to show that let's go ahead and transition back over here so that is the uh, the setup <clears throat> Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring up uh, everything's powered on outside. Everything's ready to go. Uh, we have 
the connection to the Raspberry Pi out there and we're just kind of waiting for it to get a little more darker. Um, but what I could do is I could go ahead and, and show you the the Eco Server Indie Web Manager. Uh, this is the Ecos Indie Web Manager. This is what I use to start up the the drivers uh, for Indie, and it's connected actually out on the Raspberry Pi. Now I'm creating a another video that talks about how I set up the Raspberry Pi with Indie and Ecos and the web manager and a few other things and that that I should be done with that uh, either tomorrow or within the next few days so this is a nice handy tool uh, you don't have to start anything um, you know you don't have to log into the Raspberry Pi everything's kind of right there so all I need to do is is press the start uh, command but basically it sets up your drivers uh, your various drivers uh, for for the session, and it's and, re, and it remembers them. There's the KHY driver, the ZWO driver. I also have an ASI filter wheel there, and I have a smart focuser um, which is homemade, and I also have the Ioptron EQ IEQ45 Pro. Um, you would go ahead and just select what what equipment you have. I'm going to go ahead and start this. It shows that the server's online and it started the drivers there, so we're all set. I'm going to go ahead and and take this away, and we're going to go ahead and start up e K Stars. So give me a second here while I bring up K Stars. It's going to start up in another window, so I'll have to drag it over here to this display. So here's K-STARS. It's an astronomical program. You could, you could run this. Um, you could plan for observations for the night. Uh, and I have to admit, I didn't have enough time to, to sit down and even figure out what I'm going to image tonight. But we'll figure something out. Um, this is a nice little observational planner, guide, uh, interface to equipment. It kind of does everything. It does even uh, scheduling. So the first thing we're going to go ahead and do is start up Ecos. This is where the main Ecos menu is. Um, we could go ahead and edit this if we needed to. The setup here is I'm using a guiding internal. I'm using the internal program. Uh, and there's the equipment already defined. Everything's all set up on this. I have the, uh, the, the proper configurations for the telescope and the guide scope. So we're going to go ahead and start that. And that brings up an Indie control panel. And this kind of gives you a, a check to make sure everything's online and ready to go. So you have, uh, you have the, the, uh, the mount. You have the guide scope or the uh, guide camera. We have the focuser online. We have the filter, even though I don't use the filter. And then we have the uh, the main camera, the ASI 533. And everything's coming up fine. I'm not having any problems. This is a great tool to find out if you have issues, though, and you could you could check various things. One of the big biggest problems is setting up the serial devices, and we have basically two serial devices, actually three if you count what is going on with the uh, Do controller. Uh, but in this instance here we have the mount which is set up um, as slash dev slash tty mount um, and that's basically a symbolic link that I set up for the correct device and likewise we have the connection for the focuser which happens to be on TTY USB 2. By the way I solely use Linux as as much as I can so uh, I apologize for people who are not running when are not using um, you know this is not really a discussion about Windows or Mac but basically um, Linux version of this you can run these programs again running under a Windows desktop all right, everything looks good. I don't want to bore you with this stuff. Let's go ahead and get started with... Uh, it's getting still a little bit bright out. 
what I normally do is I normally uh, run some dark frames and, and do a couple of things. I'm going to skip that right now since I'm doing a live stream. Uh, let's see. So all the equipment's set up. I normally, after I have everything set up, I normally just check to make sure everything looks good and is behaving properly. So I'll go over here and click on the icon, uh, the camera icon. And the camera icon uh, will bring up and I verify that the camera is set up for the proper camera. The cooler is not on right now. I will probably start that up in a little bit. But I normally just go ahead and do a quick capture for a preview just to see if, if it's responding. Camera is responding. We're getting just a dark image. I have the uh, dew shield still on the camera or on the telescope, so we're not going to get any images. But it's a good check. Something did come back. And let's go ahead and do the same thing with the guide camera. And the way I do that is I go into the guide icon and go ahead and just do a quick capture and what that will do is it'll capture the image off the guide camera these are the settings on how um, you set these guide uh, the scope up we could go into a little more detail um, if anybody's interested so that came back up fine so we know we're connected we know everything looks good um, what we're going to be doing is I'm just waiting for it to get a little more darker it probably won't be good to start imaging until probably sometime after nine but before that I do a polar alignment and I really like I really like uh, ECOS and the way it does the polar alignment and we'll go into that and I'll show you how that works uh, let me see here what else did I want to show you oh <laughs> yeah let's bring up that um, I also have the Indy uh, Metro uh, Meteo State, um, the Met, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Meteorology Station or Met, Metro Station. Um, temperature is about 10 degrees Celsius, pressure is climbing, and the humidity is climbing, and that's typical for what we see here. This clouds, it's, it varies through the years. Uh, if it's in the summertime, I can't really go by that very well. In the wintertime, it's dead on. And this is probably kind of true on in the, in the amount of clouds out there right now. So um, this is a nice little program. It's powered or <laughs> nice little setup. It's powered by a, um, a Raspberry Pi uh, Zero and connected to an Arduino which has all the uh, sensors on it, the temperature sensor, the pressure sensor, and humidity sensor, as well as a, a, a light sensitive um, sensor or light sensor so you can see uh, the irradiance. So that's, <laughs> that's what I wanted to share with, with you on that. All right, so let's go ahead and um, th this pace I am going to probably start planning on setting up for polar alignment. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and step out and take off the dew shields off the telescope out outside and um, just make sure everything's turned on. Uh, the dew shield is uh, the dew shield is working, or the dew dew system is working. That sort of thing. Uh, so give me a second. I'm going to be right back, and um, then we'll go ahead and see if we could capture some images, at least for the polar alignment. So I'm going to go ahead and mute this, and I'll be right back in about a minute or so.
All right, I'm back. It's amazing. All the clouds are gone right now. So that's that's good news. So let's go ahead and do a quick capture on the guide scope. I usually uh, do this. It'll tell us if it's if it's dark enough, if we're capturing any stars. I'm going to turn down the exposure setting here and turn that down to about two seconds. I'm just going to do a quick capture. The scope is pointed at Polaris and and you can see that it is capturing some data. You can see I have dust on the uh, on the camera too. One of these days I got to fix that, but it doesn't it it doesn't really do anything uh, for guiding so it's like yeah <laughs> so there um, so it's still a little bit too bright out to do any uh, to go through the polar alignment uh, process uh, let me see here all right well I got some messages here Somebody asked me about Astroberry. No, I'm not using Astroberry or StellarMate. It's a homegrown, a homegrown uh, Raspberry Pi setup. And I, as I said, said earlier, I am creating a video that goes out and describes this process of how I used a Raspberry Pi 4 and set it set it up as uh, an Ecos Indie server and that's coming up in the near future and it's exactly the setup that I'm running right now uh, it's nice because it reduces uh, I, I don't get me wrong I, I don't mind StellarMate I don't mind Ra As A A Astroberry um, I think some of it's a little bloated um, and when you do it when you do your own you could kind of reduce things that you don't need um, there's there's some things that uh, you you really do need and other things you could kind of go no I don't need that so it it varies uh, and it's easy to support too but I get it that people might want to have uh, Astroberry or StellarMate uh, StellarMate because it is supported and you can do various uh, you know it, it, depending it's it's it, it's a good deal uh, let's see. Let's go ahead and do another capture here. And I apologize. I'm a bit nervous. This is kind of a new thing for me, the software and everything. So uh, bear with me if I stumble as much as I am. All right. Um, it's getting a little darker out there. What else can I talk about while we're waiting? Um, you know, I really should probably figure out what I'm going to take an image of tonight, and or at least get started on. I sometimes I just image, um, just to image, Im, uh, just to image uh, various different um, objects, and you know, it's more of fun in taking a look at objects rather than capturing the pretty pictures. And that, um, that's sometimes fun to do. I like to do that when I'm, I'm hosting like a party or something and, and people are over and I just want to go, hey, come on, we could take a look at some cool objects. And, and, and they get a kick out of it. Uh, and I might do some of that here. I might not. Um, I don't, like I say, have a real plan. Um, let's move this out of the way. Uh, I'm just going to close this window for now. Um, this is a bright object that, that's easy to uh, take a look at, and, and maybe we'll image that. It's, um, it's M81. It's a kind of a nice little uh, uh, galaxy. This is kind of the galaxy time of the year, by the way. There's not a lot of nebulas. Most of the beautiful nebulas are, are um, gone <laughs> and setting off to the uh, the west, and and so now we're getting into springtime and galaxy. So you can show. I don't know. Last time I checked this, I could not bring up this image, but it looks like it's working. 
So this is this is an image that uh, the DSS. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not even sure. You know what organization took this, but it's there and it's nice because you could kind of preview what the image should look like. Uh, matter of fact, let me let me transition over to something. Let's see. Here's that exact same image. <clears throat> These are the images that I've taken in my backyard with the telescope set up. Uh, and these are most of the recent images that I've, I've taken. And like I said, it's, it's a fun hobby. It's, it's great to play around with. And I, I know I'm stalling here because <laughs> I'm waiting for it to get a little more darker so we could go through the polar alignment. But uh, there's some of the images that I've taken uh, with this setup. And I used to use a ASI-178 with a, a RGB filter. And being in Minnesota, it's really um, time consuming to sit down and, and shoot as many of, of images of the target that you needed to do. And especially if you wanted to have multiple sessions to view the object and pull the object in. And I found that it became really time consuming capturing all the images uh, with a uh, um, basically a monochrome ca camera capturing the various different colors red green blue and putting them together uh, since then I got an ASI 533 which is wonderful because it is a colored camera and now I'm not spending my time capturing a bunch of images uh, I could capture just one you know one big long session and carry it forward if I needed to all right so let's go back to the desktop here I think we've got tired of that um so that's something we're going to maybe take a look at let me bring back the uh, ecos and I'm going to do a quick capture here again we'll see if we're getting ah now we're getting see how the background is getting darker and uh, we could probably start the process. It's still still a little light, but I don't think it'll it will be uh, difficult to do. So what you want to do is uh, there is a setting here for the astrometry. The astrometry setup here is uh, basically you could you could solve and capture where, where the telescope is pointed. In this case what we're going to do is we're going to go through the polar alignment and um, basically well let's see that the telescope right now is pointed uh, right at Polaris in a vertical orientation um, which is fine. One thing that I have to double check and, and verify is we want to make sure we're using the guide scope and we want to make sure we're using the right camera and we want to select an exposure that's appropriate so we're going to go 3.5 um, seconds once that is all set up um, all you need to do let's stop this capture and solve I don't know probably because I touched it um, what we'll do is we're going to go ahead and go through the polar alignment uh, process now. Um, everything should be set up correctly. It's going to take three images and in each after each image it's going to rotate the telescope 30 degrees, take another image and rotate it in 30, 30 degrees. So that ding right there, I don't know if you heard it, but that indicates that it's uh, captured the first image and provided a solution. And what's going on here? Ah, there we go, okay. All right. <clears throat> capturing the third and final image and solving for it.
and there it is. Okay, so because I set up my telescope every time, it's always going to be off. So here is the, let me make this a little bit bigger if I can. This basic, ah, oh, they must have changed the software a little bit. Um, this provides a list of where you need to point uh, the telescope using your azimuth and elevation controls of the mount. Um, and I have this darn cursor so big, but I think it will be okay. So what you want to do is you want to select a target. And I'm going to go ahead and pick this target. Oh, and that reminds me. Oh, I forgot to mention, and I forgot to set it up. So bear with me a second. I use a my cell phone using a VNC connection to this desktop. And that way I could take a look at the and, and monitor when I move the telescope around as I move the azimuth elevation because I'm not going to be in here watching this monitor so I have to start up the the uh, the VNC the virtual uh, uh, what is it uh, computer network uh, connection which it already is so this is what <clears throat> we want to do is we want to take that star and we want to essentially move it I better reduce that a little bit we're going to move this star here over to here so I'm going to hit next and I am going to bump up this just yeah, it might be okay at one second because it's gotten dark enough um, so what you do is you go ahead and select that and you hit refresh now what's going to do is it's going to sit here and spin now what I have to do is I have to go outside and you'll see the telescope move or the star move into the the direction. And this is a little different. This is always sometimes interesting when you upgrade uh, ECOS and, and, and this, so this is the first time I've used this K-Star version so it's a little bit different. Um, so I'm going to go out here. I'll be right back. Um, just give me a second. And uh, we'll go ahead and uh, come back here live in a second. I'm going to go ahead and mute the microphone. So you'll just just uh, stand by here, and I'll adjust the uh, the uh, sco uh, scope mount. Hang on.
bringing them back. That's close enough. So we're going to go ahead and hit done. And then what I normally do is try and go through it one more time just to make sure that everything is good. And this might be a good idea because I'm it's been a while since I've done this. We've had such crappy weather, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's been it's been either too cold, too much too much snow or um just rain. So, let's see. After now see they changed this again. Normally what happens is the telescope will go ahead and park itself. So this is interesting. I don't know. This behavior is different and it's a good thing I checked. So I parked. Okay, I parked the scope. Good. And tracking's off. So let's go ahead and go back and restart the process. Now before before I do that, let me let me do a quick check visually at the scope just to make sure that we're back at the park position. So give me a second here. All right, looks good, not a cloud in the sky. So let's go ahead and start this one more time. <clears throat> See where we are in this. Yeah, I gotta, usually what I do is I, I do a bench check and I must have updated my desktop without um, thinking about it and it updated the new K stars and that's always kind of throws me off because the behavior can be a little different and what I like to do is I like to take Linux and block those changes so that they won't update until I'm ready for that for that program to be updated so I'll have to look into that tomorrow and see about making sure I uh, freeze that package I think that's the proper term they use see if there's anything uh, why do you use the guide scope for polar alignment well that's a good question I can because of the field of view with this telescope setup I can use the primary scope um, but the really the limiting factor here is that the primary scope has a field of view that's smaller and if I remember right, we at least need one degree field of view for the um, for the polar alignment software to work correctly. So it's just that I've always gotten in the habit of using the guide scope to do the polar alignment. Um, I can probably go ahead and use the primary to do this, but it's just a habit. And since I'm getting into the summertime. I'm going to be taking out the 8-inch reflector that I have, and uh, it probably has the max field of view of half a degree. So, it's just habit. Let's see. Um, VNC. <laughs> okay, uh, that's a good question. Um, let me show you something. Uh, I know that this is on. Um, What's it called? Uh, give me a second here. Um, boy, can't think of the name offhand. Give me a second. Um, oh, why can't I think of that name? Um, let me see if I can find it. Nope, 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 nope. Um, oh, I'll get back to that. But a VN, the VNC connection allows you to the VNC connection allows you to display your des desktop to a remote device. 
and in this case I was using my telephone my Android device my cell phone and it will display whatever is displayed on my computer screen and then I can use that while I'm going outside to move and adjust that that uh, mount setting as you can see here I'm not going to bother with this it's pretty close I mean you know it's it's maybe a little bit off but it's not worth me going out there and, and futzing with that again so I'm gonna just go ahead and hit next and done and that should do it so let's see if again <laughs> the behaviors change so we're going to go ahead and um, I'll leave that because I think it won't matter so let's let me move this screen out of the way for a second and show you where we're at so this is where we're at in the night sky where the telescope is pointed it's right in Polaris it's not quite right on but it's close enough what we're going to do now is we're going to move over to a, 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 a close star here just to do a quick focusing check on it so I'm going to go over here and we're going to right click on that and um, go ahead and go to now what that'll do is it'll move the mount over to the star. Now it might not be accurate depending on on the setting and and setting time settings and it could be a little bit off. So we're going to come back to that by bringing this back up and we're going to go ahead and check that alignment using the astrometry data. In this case we're to use solution results we're going to go slew to target and I'm not going to forget this but we're going to go to the primary scope at this point in time uh, let's see anything else I need to update oh there should be a primary scope if you don't do change that primary scope it will not have the correct field of view and then you'll run into problems so we're going to go ahead and solve and capture again we're using the primary scope so you, you could see we're not centered we don't have anything really centered in that target space and there there's the there it is we could also put a target in here it shows that it's dead on what this does is it synchronizes the telescope and, and points everything so we know we're in, in good shape. Now, the other thing I'd like to do is, is since this is pretty, the star is pretty uh, uh, dim right now, which is good. I don't mind that. we got to go through a focusing step. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and turn on the cooling system here. We'll go down to minus 10. 10 degrees centigrade and we'll start this process to cool down the, the uh, camera. Cooling down the camera helps with the noise and the the the, um, the bottom noise level and and it brings up the signal a little bit more. And hi uh, I see my son's joined here. <laughs> Okay, let's see. If you want to be in C, you ask before is polar alignment. You've already answered. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, uh, BKM. You know, I appreciate you guys joining here. It's kind of interesting, and, and I won't feel bad if you have other things to do because this is probably, you know, a long time consuming process. But it is dark outside, which is nice. Um, let's see, where are we at here? We're, we're down to minus Earth two degrees centigrade I can't take a well I could probably not check that and it will not look at that if you check this box here it essentially says I'm not going to take your picture until you reach down to that temperature so we're going to just go ahead and go through the focusing now I built this focuser using Arduino and some really inexpensive stepper motors and if you watched if if you saw the beginning of this uh, live stream you saw a little bit about the equipment 
it's a real simple setup and it works pretty good. So we're just going to go ahead and, and, and go ahead and start the autofocus process. So what it does is it goes ahead and, and looks at a bunch of stars and basically computes the HFR rating for that. And the idea here is the you want to make that number this number here down here as low as possible. And you also like to see a nice curve as you go in and out of focus. So it sits there and it'll capture a bunch of images as you can see down there by the numbers and it's trying to find out the best focus point and once it's done it saves that focus point. There's a lot of stuff to do just to start up and just to start up observation um, for an object. <laughs> Uh, but once it's done, I mean, it, the, this really makes it, uh, can, the ECOS really makes it easy. I started off way back when using a 6-inch and an old manual mead mount. Well, it had a had electric motor, but that was about it. And I remember I was so happy with my cookbook camera to get 30-second exposure times without star trails. <laughs> And I didn't have a guide scope, and it was just a different world back then, you know, back in the uh, early 90s, uh, where, um, what was the guy? Richard Berry, he wrote a book about uh, cookbook, and it was a simple cookbook camera you could build. And uh, I went ahead and did that. All right, so it did its magic, and it wasn't too far off from the original, so it looks good. We've got our focus taken care of. Now let's go ahead and have, have some fun time here. Um, I am going to go ahead and select that for, and I'm just going to go ahead and, I have really a terrible limited sky, but I'm pretty sure we're close to the meridian here, and I'm going to go ahead and look at Bodhi's galaxy, and we'll go ahead and take a shot of that, and just to do a quick capture. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over to that object, and it, since it has to go over and has to do a meridian flip, it's going to take a little bit of time, not too much. So the telescope's made it over there. That looks great. <clears throat> Let me bring back this window here, and we're going to go ahead and do an astrometric check to see where we are. He already knows where he thinks he's pointing. We're going to do a solve and capture. And there you go. You can actually see some of the galaxies right now. Let me move this out of the way for you. So without with with a simple 3.5 second exposure, we see a galaxy up here, we see the galaxy centered here, this is M M81, and there's another one over here. Now, what I normally do is I'll set up a bunch of images. First, we're going to have to set up the guide, guiding for it. So we've centered the image, now we're going to go for the guide aspect of it. So I'll bring up the guide and we'll go ahead and start the guide process. Now I'm going to go ahead and, and clear the existing guide information and hit the guide button. What that does is it resets the calibration and it goes through a calibration cycle. So it's going to go here and pick a star and go through calibration. Uh, one of the other features that they just added I think was on um, 352 or um, they added a calibration output so you could see the actual calibration as it goes through its its calibration mode. I have had lots of issues with guiding and I'm still not quite I'm not satisfied with my guiding. I think it could be done better. I know that there is a periodic error in the right ascension of my worm gear. It's very frustrating. 
and uh, sometimes I chase my tail guiding. And by the way, there's another way. Um, this is using the internal guider. You can use Push Here Dummy 2, PHD 2, to guide. Um, so if you prefer that method, that works well. Uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm a little bit rusty on that at this point in time. So it's what it's done is it's it's gone through the calibration and it's sitting here and following. Now hopefully, and I'm trying to remember, I did a bunch of stuff. <laughs> I think it was with uh, PhD2 rather than this, but we'll just leave it alone. Hopefully it'll be okay. And uh, so it's guiding and it's tracking okay. It could be it could be as far off as two and a half. And I think with the camera setting, um, I believe it sets guide limits of uh, a board if it's three and a half and it will suspend guiding and, and start over. So we're going to go ahead and set up the exposure for the first image. And I'm afraid I'm going to well, not afraid, but I'm going to do a, a three, 300 second exposure. I find that that's the most uh, useful. And we'll do um, just five. And we'll, as they come across, you could see them, which is kind of interesting. Um, we're, to have, we're to have the set. If guide deviation is two, yep, and guide abort is fine. This is where you would set up the filters if you're using a, mo uh, a monochrome camera or if you're using a special filter. You also need to make sure that you set up the gain. Um, the gain I typically use is 180 with an offset of 50, I believe. Uh, we want to make sure that the format fits, it's light, and we do have uh, the prefix. I usually prefix it with some other number so I know in case something happens or I want to uh, do another session, I'll, I know how to identify that. Um, so everything looks good. Temperature is set. We're ready to start the exposure. We're, we're guiding, and we're going to go ahead and add this sequence to the queue. So what we do is, once we've set everything here, if we hit the plus key, it creates a kind of a batch file. Think of it as a batch file. So it will go through the sequence um, five, five times at 300 exposure, 300 second exposures. So let's get started with that because it's going to take <laughs> 300 seconds. In the meantime, while that's counting off, um, this is a useful image. This is kind of like your 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 main image um, display. Kind of gives you the status of everything. It tells you where your focus is, uh, how your guiding is doing, um, and what you're capturing and if you run into any issues. Now we do have a black um, square here right now because we did a quick check to make sure the camera is functioning and that happened to be placed in there. There was another thing that they added uh, a couple of versions back uh, called Analyze, and it's kind of nice because you could see how you could go back and review the logs here and see how your whole observing session was functioning and what you did and if it was having problems with anything. Um, and it does come, come in handy. Uh, I was wondering one night I was having a heck of a time, and, and I finally took a look outside and it was it was like a not a heavy fog but a, a, a pretty <laughs> a pretty uh, hazy night and it was the wind was coming up and and that really threw my guide guide properties off and out of there I finally gave up for the night but you could go back and look at this stuff and see what you've done so let's go back to the main now, uh, since this is a color camera, it has a debare sensor. So I've set this up so it automatically debares the, um, the, the image. If it doesn't, you would see a bunch of squares in, intermixed with the image. So this gives a nice little nicer presentation. Uh, does the focus have to be pretty close uh, for the autofocus to work? No, it could be pretty far. Um, 
as this thing's doing its thing, let's go back to the, the focus. Um, it when when the focuser quits at night it re, it basically recalibrates itself or says it sets it up for 118 steps so as long as you're not taking the camera off and on and and you have an idea that's usually within a pretty good tolerance for you to start the focusing sequence off and it will go ahead and 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 find the focus even if it's pretty far off. I have had some issues where if then I knew something was wrong but the darn thing wouldn't focus and I'm scratching my head and I go I gotta see what's going out there so I got my red flashlight out went out and I think it was in the winter time of course with minus uh, or uh, you know minus five degrees Celsius and and I'm out there with my flashlight discovering that my focuser uh, gear got loose and it was slipping in one direction so it kept on trying to focus it but it could never get there and, and so I had to go out there and, and tighten up that and once I did that it worked fine but that <laughs> it, it does a pretty good job as long as you don't have a problem okay we're down to 86 84 seconds the other thing you always when you do these long exposures even short exposures you always notice satellites and I can't tell you how many times satellites have have streaked across the image uh, it just is amazing to me uh, matter of fact the last time I was uh, taking a picture of Orion's nebula there was actually two streaks across the image in in the same image and I thought that was just amazing how much space debris or satellites are up there to cause that much traffic up up in the sky with a tiny field of view. As remember, I'm only probably, the field of view is probably uh, a little more or a little less than a degree. So it, it just amazes me. All right. Getting close to a, an image. Guiding seems to be okay tonight. Uh, I get worried when I get above 50 and about 75, then then it causes problems. Um, and as you go through it, you could see the periodic error that you get with the, um, the right ascension worm gear. All right, so there's the image. Um, let's take a nice little close-up of that. Now this is just one image. There's M81. You could see the some of the structure of the uh, galaxy. You could see the galaxy up here, and then the galaxy over here. So it's kind of cool. Um, there's a little bit of gradient in the sky background. That's kind of normal. When you do processing, it uh, will remove that. And as if you also get close to it, you see that there's a lot of noise that goes on here um, but again processing and when you stack the images it it helps resolve that and uh, you can actually see some dark lanes over here um, it's kind of interesting stacking is wonderful I love to get as much stacking as I can if I could get 30 images of a of a of a session you know of an image I'm happy the more the merrier I always say so the more captures the more you stack the better it is. Um, so that's always kind of a nice thing to be able to do is stack the images. Uh, also, there's another thing that I do here that ECOS does. It's called dithering. And what it does is it slightly moves the mount a little bit in one direction, a little bit in another, you know and then starts the next image. Now, you might go, well, why would you want to do that? Well, you're going you're gonna to register these images anyway once you've, once you've uh, uh, ready to process them. And that little bit of movement helps the software to, to identify noise. And it's, it's shown that if you do dithering, it improves your signal-to-noise ratio for uh, the image, and you'll have less noise in it. I, that's kind of an interesting thing. 
Oh, yeah, it does look nice, though. It's Usually in Minnesota, it's pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty bad as far as the night sky and, and turbulence and and uh, clarity of, of it. it. We have terrible atmospheres up here. It's not like Arizona in the desert. You'll also see a little faint galaxy right over here in between these two stars. I always love that stuff. <laughs> it just amazes me. And, and as you look at this stuff, you, you kind of wonder, you know, in amazement of what's out there. And, and look at the patterns. I mean, here's almost a, a perfect three-star pattern here. <laughs> I know it's all by chance, but it just is just really interesting to me to see. I've been doing astronomy, God, since the age of uh, 11, 12. And I remember my first telescope. It was a, a, a oh, God, what? It was some... Um, store a uh, department store telescope and it was like a 50 millimeter you know <laughs> crappy telescope that had a ball for the mount and you you know and but i used i looked at when i saw the moon for the first time i was just shocked and i think ever since then i was just uh just fell in love with astronomy and, and looking at the stars and technology has come so far i can't believe how far it's come um, even in the last 20 years, 20, 30 years. Um, I mentioned about the 90s running um, a CCD uh, home-built camera. What was that? That was like a, um, oh, let me think. It's, oh, it was terrible. It was a terrible um, resolution. Like, I don't even think, I think it was like 350 by 5 by not even 200 it was just really a low a low res image and and you go my god now we have these megapixel cameras <laughs> and it just just amazes me as always so everything looks like it's working fine we could go into a little bit of discussion i can't do any scheduling but i could talk about the scheduler this is another wonderful thing i wish i had a actual observatory where i could have this thing automated but this kind of works the same way. You 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 um, create your camera sequencing here, and you save it. And once you've saved it, um, you could call that back up to call it under a scheduler. You could select a target, and if you don't, or you could select a fits image to uh, use to find where the image is and center on it. Um, so you set up all this stuff and it sets up a sequence so you could have a whole bunch of sequences through the evening to do imaging um, you could kind of set this up and go to bed now I I've only done that once um, and I've ever it was well established and it was like one o'clock in the morning and I thought you know I got to get some sleep so I kind of just let it run and it and it did its thing and it was it was one of the best uh, I had so many images it was wonderful um, and it turned out to be a great image. But getting back to the scheduler, this allows you to set up a bunch of objects. And it, it's smart enough to figure out it doesn't want to be as uh, close to the moon. You could have it tied into the weather, so if the weather gets bad, it could shut down your, your observatory if you had one. Uh, it it uh, does constraints based on twilight and... Um, you could actually do a bunch of sequence and multiple runs. And then at the end, it could do a shutdown procedure to shut down your, your observatory or CCD or whatever you wanted to do. So this is kind of a nice little feature, but what makes it even more nicer is you could set up mosaics using this feature. So if you have an object that is, you know, multiple degrees and you wanted to have an image of that, you could set up a sequence of pictures to take that whole image and then after you, you're done you could you could combine those mosaics back together um, using software. Uh, I typically used APP or oh you know today's acronyms hang on a second uh, uh, 
app is called the astro pixel processor and it's a software that the gentleman created and it does a lot of your pre pre and post processing as well as mosaic integration and if you're dealing with mosaics that's a nice little software package to have um, I also have Pix Insight but I haven't really done any mosaics with with that I don't I'm not sure if you even can but <laughs> it wouldn't be surprised if you couldn't do that all right so let's see I've been hearing dings I don't know what that means but it looks like everybody is still happy here um, tracking's good focusing is good guiding is good and so I think we're good oh I know what happened I think well, let's see what happens I won't I, I, let me just we were close to a meridian um, and I'm wondering yeah it did a meridian flip there this is another beautiful thing about this you don't have to think about meridian flips now a meridian flip is when an equatorial mount gets close to the the highest point it has to flip around to continue guiding or to continue to follow that object in, in the telescope. And by doing that, it uh, it has to do a meridian flip. Now, ECOS takes that in consideration. And I, I could show you that a little bit because it just did a flip. A flip if HA is zero, which has already been set. So when it reached the meridian, which is this green line here, after it finished that image it did a meridian flip and after the meridian flip what it did was it did a recalibration of of the uh, of the object to recenter it so when we take a look at the image coming up here it's going to see that the image is going to be flipped around so it'll be interesting to, to share that with you so it, again it's it's it takes a lot of the automation and, and it just works and and I've noticed that when I first started using ECOS it it was kind of flaky and it was hard and I had problems with it it as time progresses it seems to get more solid and more solid um, as a as a software uh, astron astron astronomy astronomy you know program for telescope management it it really seems to really get be getting good um, all right now this is probably where you guys are probably going to be bored because I'm running out of things to say and, and all we're doing is capturing images at this point in time um, so if you have any questions for me I guess it would be a good time to ask and uh, I'll try and answer the questions as best as I can. But uh, again, I think 300 seconds. I know people do less, but um, it seems to work out. I did a bunch of tests when I got this camera, and I, I always got the best results running at 300 seconds. So I've kind of, kind of kept that that up. Um, let's see how our uh, guiding is doing. This gives you a little more detail. Actually, it's doing quite well tonight. I'm very happy with that. Believe me, I've seen it worst where it's all over the place. Um, so this is working very well tonight. And I was a little worried because I was worried that it might be a little windy out there and and causing uh, problems with the uh, the mount as it doesn't you know when we get about five to ten mile per hour wind uh, down near where the telescope is it does affect the guiding all right it's like watching snow melt here Uh, anything else going on? Nope. Okay, let's get back. Um, all 
Let me see if I could show you that. I, you could see kind of see the pattern of of the um, right ascension going back and forth a little bit, and some periodic errors. Uh, All right. Oh, six seconds. Here we go. Let's see the the image flipped and make sure everything did what it's supposed to do. There it is. And the only thing is, ah, there it is. So there it is. It it flipped it around as you could see. So it the meridian flipped and recentered everything just fine. There is an and we're centered right on the object. Um, some interesting things that I don't think that's the one. I think this is gives you the right ascension declination of the objects. So let's say you're you're trying to figure out what, where where something is. You can do that by bringing up and looking exactly where it is on a chart. So if you see a supernova and you go boy where, where you know where is this or you could you know or this strange object you could figure out where it is and check the, the charts all right I'm gonna turn that off okay I'm gonna step away just for a little bit uh, I'm gonna grab something to drink here and you guys could watch the snow melt so I'm gonna just go back here and I'm just going to fade this in a little bit. So I'll be back in just a little bit. All right, I'm back. And it seems like everything is going well. I noticed the guiding was a little bit uh, higher than it did. Let's see what, what that looks like. 
Yeah, it's okay. Oh, there's your satellite. Just went over the guide scope. So we're to have a really interesting um, image. Unfortunately, uh, that last image is going to be ruined. Maybe not, though, because, oh, no, I'm pretty sure it's ruined. <laughs> yep, it's ruined. So now this is what astronomers have to deal with is, is streaks. Actually, if you look here, I also see a faint streak that came across here. Could be even one of the Starlink satellites. Who knows? But there's a faint one that came across here. Now, post-processing, that'll probably take that right out. So I'm not too worried about that one. But if they get really bright, <laughs> that's no fun. Oh, let's see. Oh, yeah, look at this. <laughs> uh, touche. Yeah, it's too bad that happens, but uh, there's nothing I could do with it. So remember I earlier I indicated that it's kind of rare to see two satellites in the same image? Yeah, well, it's getting more and more of that way, and I'm wondering if we're not getting more of the Starlink because, um, I mean, if you think about it, if you're taking images that are, are going down to, you know, the 14th magnitude, uh, you kind of wonder if, if, you know, I know Elon Musk didn't, didn't uh, put the coding on, on most of his, his uh, Starlink satellites, but uh, it could be the fallout. All right. Um, I'm probably starting to bore people, bore, bore uh, people right now. So if you have any questions, you know, feel free to ask. Uh, if you're really tired of this and you say, "Hey, let's see if we could go take a look at another object," I'm all, I'm open for that. Um, I do have a limited view of the sky here. Um, the eastern or the eastern part of the sky is is pretty bad right now because uh, I have a huge tree in the way. But the west and southwest is, is and south is are open. Um, so uh, d -d -d -d. So as this thing's doing its, let me put, push this over here. Um, see what's out there, uh, just to see curiosity wise. Now I know Leo is, is getting there. Let's see, I, I see basically this part of the sky here um, on this one, on this side of the meridian. Uh, let's see, the moon's going away. That's good. Um, that's why I say that there's, this is satellite, or this is galaxy time of the month, because you see a lot of the galaxies here, like M66. That's a galaxy. Uh, M96 is a galaxy. There's some open clusters. Um, there's even as it's I can't get these but there's actually uh, galaxy clusters out there that you could uh, take a look at um, there's like the Vir Virgo galaxy cluster there's a couple of other ones so it's kind of it's kind of fun to try and and take a um, deep sky object uh, picture, you know, kind of like a Hubble picture of, of these galaxies, even though they don't show a lot of detail, it just amazes me how many uh, galaxies are collected in a small area. So, this is where we're at right now. Let's center that track and that's kind of 
kind of matches up with the image um, as you could see here you know you have it's a little bit off but it's not too bad Okay, this is the fifth image here. I don't know if I want to do any any more of this, but <clears throat> normally I'd do like 30 of them. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to make it kind of a short evening anyway. Um, I don't know why though, because it's a rare night to have finally get a clear skies, but I understand based on clear skies, which is a program that I use, that the clouds will be coming in earlier than later tonight. Uh, so I, I have a feeling it's going to be a short night anyway. That's kind of like, well, I, I, I'm probably going to kind of reserve these live streams for um, moon nights, I call them. It always seems like when there's a full moon, it, it blows away all the clouds, I swear. And you have these clear skies, <laughs> but it, it's lousy for taking images, serious images anyway, of deep sky objects. So my joke is the uh, uh, moon is always blowing away the clouds. And so it's a perfect time to, for me, perfect time for testing equipment, uh, trying different things, checking out uh, processes, um, doing um, tweaks here and there to see how the various uh, things interact, uh, different settings. So it, it, it is it is good to kind of, I try and get out as much as I can when there's a clear night, I guess is what I'm trying to say. All right, um, let's, let's try, which satellite is, or which, Tell you what, let's take a look at this one. I have not seen this one. I'm not. Re I don't recognize that one. Okay, this will stop my guiding automatically. Come on. Oh, eh, it's on the meridian again. I should have waited. So now the telescope's flipping around again. But it'll show up. <clears throat> hope. <laughs> ah, here it comes. Let's take a look at this. I'm not familiar with this galaxy. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll take a look at the uh, with K-Stars and bring it up and show DD DSS image. See what it looks like. And it's a faint one. This is a faint one. It's a faint uh, spiral galaxy. Looks like on a different edge. Um, not a lot of stars in it. So let, let's take a look at that. I'm going to go ahead and do a just a simple five second exposure. Uh, on that so let's go ahead and do an alignment and solve and capture again what this will do is it'll center that object into our telescope this is another nice feature here is you could uh, take a look at how well it's it's solving there's 16 that's the latest image that it grabbed so it doesn't look like there's very much there I'll tell you but let's take a long let's do another five second exposure I'm gonna go ahead and turn guiding on because um, you definitely need guiding for five for five minute exposures It's doing the calibration right now. You could tell by by the by the air log or the logs down here. So once that gets done, <laughs> unfortunately we're right at the meridian. 
Uh, I have to laugh. It's going to do a meridian flip even right after the first image. Come on. Maybe I could do a, a quick demo on the scheduler too. That might be an interesting thing for some people to look at in the future. So we'll do this. We'll do a quick schedule, uh, scheduler example um, live and probably just call it an evening. Uh, I'm sure I'm boring everybody to death here. Uh, okay, so it's guiding. Let's go ahead and do a quick capture. So I'm just going to go here and take a picture. So the one thing I also have a hard time with this and I have to fool around more with is, is flat files. I've been having terrible, terrible, uh, um, I'm having terrible uh, issues with the flat files. Um, last time I took the Orion's Nebula, it had a, a perfect circle right around the horse head nebula image <laughs> and uh, the flat files are supposed to fix that and I thought I did the calibrations correctly it, it looked good uh, but when I processed the uh, the flat file it, it 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 didn't seem to help so that's something I have to investigate in the near future While that's doing that, let's take a look at, we'll go back and take a look at that. It'll let us know when it's done. I want to go over here and take a look at, um, take a look at a scheduled object. We'll, we'll try and set up a scheduler. This might be an interesting thing right here. This is M105. Let me get yeah right here M ninety six yeah let's try and schedule M one hundred five I'll show you an example of of the scheduler use with um, this object M one hundred five so as soon as this thing gets back we'll we'll go ahead and give that a shot and with the scheduler it will also automatically do the uh, astrometric check it will do the focusing it will do you know all the stuff for the automation now I have seen issues where it's failed though I'm not completely 100% buying into it I uh, buying into setting it up and walking away because I always tend to watch this just to make sure it doesn't have problems and when it has problems, I usually have to uh, intervene and, and, and fix it. Let's see how we're doing over here. Guiding seems to be okay. A lot of the, the peaks here are from it dithering and then going back. Um, matter of fact, I thought they had a little point where it shows that it dithers. I might be wrong. Uh, this might be the dithering. See what I mean by clicking on some of this information, you can see how well you've been doing through these different sessions. And, different captures so it kind of gives you a nice little summary of what's happening uh, this probably is the dithering well no I don't I'm not sure oh this is the period where we we dropped out we're reguiding so let's see where we're at here um, let's 
Let's go back here. We've got to be getting close. We're less than a minute away. The other thing about live streaming that I didn't really realize is the delays involved with the live stream. It, it does have um, <laughs> quite a bit of delay. So I'm looking at the pr studio preview and I'm seeing that uh, it's, it's definitely kind of lagged. Um, this is all new to me so it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. I've been wanting to get into some YouTube videos, not to make money, but just to just to play and, and learn learn new skills so to be so to, so to speak. Okay, here's that boy that's a faint one. Yeah, you know, we'd have to take many, many images to bring this out with detail, but you could see here that that's that image. Um, and I'll go ahead and, and move this out of the way. Oh I already left it. Um, but that galaxy is pretty weak and it's pretty dis diffused. So there is that uh, kind of boring actually. Sorry about that. But let's go back here just out of curiosity. I move this out of the way. And let's go back over to the information about this object. So it's 11.07 magnitude galaxy, and it's probably pretty dispersed because it's kind of somewhat large. Um, and the again, the DSS image looks like this. And this compared to our image is right here like this. So we definitely are seeing these bright clusters of gas or stars, uh, it's probably gas uh, on on here. So it's eh, kind of interesting. I first <laughs> haven't really uh, really done that. Oh, and look, we're at a status meridian flip. Well, it doesn't matter because we're going to go ahead and schedule something. So let's do scheduling. So the first thing you want to do is you want to set up your exposures. So we're going to go ahead and remove this. And we're going to do uh, five exposures, five counts, and we want to make sure all of this stuff is correct. And for the prefix, I'm just going to go so I know um, M105 as the prefix, because we're going to save this. Um, and everything looks correct nothing else should change all I should need to do is I need to go ahead and, and save this sequence so uh, we'll add the sequence and we'll go ahead and save the capture sequence now bear with me while I go through my mess of jobs observation sequences and we're to call this M105 uh, Loom 300S. So that's what we're going to call the sequence for the exposures. And we're going to go ahead and hit save. Next thing we're going to go is bring up the scheduler and we're target. We're going to do a search for M105. We should find it. Hit and select it. And it, we also need to have a sequence file. And in this case, I got to go through the menus again and find everything. Uh, there it is. Hit open. Um, we're not going to worry about priority. Uh, I will go ahead and select everything for the steps. We probably should do the profile. So what I'm doing here is I'm setting up a sequence for the for observing. Um, 
And what this will do is once you start this, just like a big observatory, it'll go ahead and sequence everything and uh, go through that. And we'll walk through what, what happens when that, that occurs. So let me just make this a little bit bigger and go ahead and, and add that sequence. Now sometimes if I'm testing, I'll go ahead and save the sequence too. In this case, I'm not going to bother. It's either going to work or not. All the rest of the stuff should be okay. We'll start the sequence. It says started. Okay, now it says it's slewing to target. Let's take a look at the um, the overall mount or the overall status. You see that the mount is moving over there and as this is doing that I'm gonna get rid of this and we'll go over to the other side of the sky here. If I can find it. Come on. Where are we? Here we go. Okay. So here's where the mount is right now. What it's doing now is it's going through the focusing. So let's take a look at the focusing. So it's going out there and should be automatically doing the focusing. I don't expect to have the focus, focus too far off from the original uh, settings, but we'll see. As you can see up there, the steps are set for 826 previously, and we're, we're going through the sequence here. It's now trying 825. Again, the whole idea of the sequencer is, is to set it up and then walk away. And you could set up a whole observing evening or night by doing this. And like I said, I'm not too comfortable with doing that yet. I like to babysit it. <clears throat> and hopefully this will just work flawlessly. Uh, but I've seen times where it doesn't. You know, there might be an issue with guiding or there might be another issue. Okay, what is going on here? Uh, where are we here? Focusing. Okay, so it's still it's still doing its its focusing. Let's move this up here so we can see. You know, and it does take sometimes take some time to go through focusing. Uh, right now, I guess we're I don't know how many iterations we've gone through. Come on! You see, it likes around eight hundred and twenty something. Also, I find when the sky is is um, turbulent, it takes longer to go through this because you'll you'll your H F R values fluctuate quite a bit. Huh? Come on! <laughs> Seems like it's having problems here. Let's see. Just seems like it's having problems tonight. The other thing in taking into consideration with focusing problems is backlash. I mean, I'm not sure how much backlash my focuser has, but that's always a possibility that there's backlash. There's different algorithms you could use or different mechanics that you could use as far as um, setting this up, what processes it's using, what mechanics it's using. 
and this could be fine-tuned. So finally, after seven iterations, it's focused. And it went from 826 to 822, which is a <laughs> very small amount. Let's go back up to our main, uh, main page for status here, our summary page, and see where we're at. Um, so we're tracking. Focus is complete. It should be doing the guiding right now. So guided port. Let's take a look at the guide, see how we're doing here. Um, it's clearing detection. It's going to go ahead and pick a star and calibrate. I think I lost all my viewers too, <laughs> which is cool. Uh, but this might be useful for somebody to know, to review later. I'll go ahead and um, when I end the stream, I'll go ahead and save this and, and make it available and uh, update anything I can with it. That's the problem with live streams and astronomy is it takes a long time to to do stuff. It's not it's not a quick and and rewarding thing. It's 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 like uh, watching 3D printers print. <laughs> and if anybody has a 3D printer, you know what I mean by that. Okay, it just did a ding, so that means it's guiding. You can see it starting to guide here. Now let's go back to our... it seems to be okay. Hopefully it's not going to get crazy. I always like to watch the guide because it's sometimes I've seen it just <laughs> seem to work pretty good and it just goes off. Like see how it's starting to go off? But it corrected itself so we're good. Alright let's go back here and it's doing the capturing. So so what it will do is it'll go through this capturing sequence and, and after, in this case, five counts, it will then go ahead and and end the sequence. And in and the end of the sequence too, you can, you know, uh, it, it will, at the end of the sequence, you could pick certain things you could do. Um, and you could even shut down the observatory if you want to. Um, I'm not sure I don't have anything specific so is this things is this things going I wanted to show one more thing here um, let me bring up another window and this is the nerdy stuff so I apologize And I'm not sure if anybody's interested in this, but I'm going to go ahead and just kind of explain. Make this so you can see it easier. That's good enough. I wrote a script here called um, Ecos Job Scheduler. And I wanted something that I could do when I could do when I'm not, I don't have to have the telescope set up, but I could set up a, a sequence or a job sequence uh, or a scheduled sequence. And I could bring that up when I'm ready to go ahead and, and start the observation. So I wrote a script out there and it's still a little bit of preliminary. I am not finished with it, but essentially what you can do is it's based on my specific camera but it can be you know changed accordingly but it allows you to create an exposure sequence create a single job sequence or create multiple job sequences uh, it has some utilities like list exposure sequences uh, list job sequences and I don't believe I have the change exposure sequence or change job sequence working yet. Um, it's been a while since I've played around with this and worked on this. But talking about that exposure sequence, um, let's go ahead and create an exposure sequence. Uh, 
So we'd select one and we want 300. We want a number of images of 20, for instance. We want to set up the camera temperature to minus 10. Uh, we want light, uh, light type image and we're going to call this um, M, let's say M95. Uh, and we're going to keep the gain of 180 and offset of 50 and we want luminosity filter and what this has done is it created a a se sequence um, like we just did using the the menu system but it's been offline you don't have to have K stars operating or, or knowing uh, you know, or the uh, the camera connected up to the telescope or the telescope connected or any of that you could do it kind of offline the only tool that you might need is the K-STARS planetarium program so that's kind of a handy thing um, and you could co create a a job single sequence and it will ask you the target name M92 and it will ask you for the right ascension and declination of that object now I'm just going to go ahead and put put some numbers in because it doesn't matter. Uh, so we'll call 0, 0.42, 0, 0, and um, uh, keep it kind of close to each other. Uh, sorry, I can't type tonight. Uh, and do you want to focus during sequences? Yes. And it then will ask you what kind of job sequence you want. Well, we want the first one because we created it. So we'll go ahead and hit one and it'll prompt you if it's correct. Yes, it is. And you're basically done. Um, it created that job sequence in the directory where it needs to be. Now I'm only bringing that up is because I always find it frustrating as I have to have everything set up before I could do a job sequence. Now I have the ability to create a job sequence uh, outside of of ecos and it seems to work pretty pretty well uh, I can't show you this because we have a job running in the sequencer so I can't interrupt this so I can't load that in to show you but you get the idea why is that mouse going crazy over there it's probably me <laughs> I think I have a habit of talking with my mouse. You know how people talk with their hands? I talk with my mouse, so I apologize. If you go crazy with the mouse going over, I'll, I'll work on that, I promise you. Uh, let's see where we are in the sequence of events here. Um, it actually created, created a couple of, uh, it created the first image. There's the image of, see I'm doing it with my hands again. There's the image of the galaxies. So we know that the sequence is working. Um, so you know what? I think I've done enough. Um, I know nobody is listening here right now, so I'm probably going to call it a night. Uh, we'll go ahead and publish this video. Please subscribe if you like this sort of things. Please add comments. Um, I will plan to try and do more videos like this or just uh, tutorials about ECOS um, and uh, I think it's a, a really a cool program and I have I'm kind of a Linux geek nerd anyway so uh, I prefer using Linux over Windows and I know Windows has gotten better over the years but I still remember many years of frustrations dealing with Windows systems and I just don't, I, 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 I'm happy with the way Linux functions and works. So um, with that, I think I'm going to call it an evening. I appreciate the people who stuck around here and uh, thank you for the questions and comments. Please subscribe, hit the like button if you like this and uh, have a rest of the evening uh, or rest of your day. Take care and thank you very much. We'll talk to you later.